So we'll take this example of uh, we'll take a data set and we'll walk through each of the, all these boxes that you see these eight fundamental boxes. These are nothing but those fillers that we saw um, as a proposition that, that we spoke about in the previous slides. And in start, we will take a data set and we'll run through each of these one by one. So uh, the, the two sections to it, how do we actually you know, utilize this during the model development and how do we do it once the model has been um, deployed? So how do we go about doing this entire process? So now I'll, I'll just quickly walk you through this entire process one by one. Um, so what we do is we actually start off with the first one. We have a data set in place and the data set that we are currently leveraging, it's basically a binary classification data set. So if we look at the data set, we, it's a heart disease data set wherein what we want to do is to say that whether uh, an individual is having uh, heart disease or not. That, that's what the data set is all about. So that, that's one. And now given that we have this data set in place, we want to do some exploratory data analysis and understand how it looks like. Now all of this, whatever we are demonstrating, it's, it's a part of the process which is automated the way we work with. Um, and what we get as, as a part of this automated process is a report. And that report basically gives up um, the exploratory analysis of the data. So what we get to see is a different distribution of the, the columns or the features that we had, how it looks like. It just gives a head start to understand how our data looks like. That's the first part of it. Now, within this EDA itself comes the responsible AI part of detecting biasness in the data set. Now, what we've done is we've built a framework which basically assesses which of the features that we have in the data set are actually biased or not. So you see these features getting displayed in form of a report, wherein the last column is basically a metric, a statistical metric to determine whether a feature is biased or not. Ideally, this number should be closer to zero this ranges from minus one to plus one anything beyond or far away from zero is something that you can attribute to as bias and that's where you get to know certain features whether they are biased or not so this basically helps us in understanding that even even if you don't have knowledge of the data set say for example if you get a mass data set from a customer wherein they have hundreds of features uh, tagged as f1 f2 f3 fn till f100 Still, if we run this framework behind on top of it, what it will do is it will give out this report with these SVDs, which will help us in understanding which features are biased. So what it does is it allows us to get back to the customer and ask them these questions that, you know, this feature is something which we are seeing as a biased one. Do you want us to mitigate? So depending upon that business conversation, it will help us to make sure how do we build the models when we uh, want to make sure that we want to mitigate these biases. So this is a part of the exploratory data analysis. That's the first part. The second one is the feature engineering. So again, again, a, a, a framework of ours or capability of ours or rather accelerator comes into picture. Wherein this this entire framework that you see, this autofeet.py is py is the file um, wherein we have the code embedded, which basically creates the features and then does the feature selection part on top of it in an automated way. So that's what the feature engineering, the second point is all about. And then given that we have done this, these two steps, we move to the model development. Now, given that we are getting into model development, uh, it's important for us to understand that we, we just didn't want to make it model centric. The essence here is to make sure that we cater to the data centric part of it as well. And that's where the trust soup part of it comes into picture, wherein we may want to make sure that all the, 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 the nuances of the data are getting captured um, in terms of quantifying how quality or how good the quality of the data is. Now, given that these three pointers are covered, we come to the model development and we tag back to the first step, wherein we figured out which feature we actually wanted to mitigate because there were biases in it. That's where when we build out this entire framework of ours, we have this experiment model experiment.py as, as the entire model script, which is written behind the scenes, um, which basically makes sure that whichever features we had figured out as biased in the first step, we are mitigating them as we go along. And what we get as an end result is a suite of models or experiments that we have run um, in, in form of a detailed report. So these reports that you see, all these are the models that we have run, making sure that the biasness that we detected in the first step is actually mitigated. So you'll see a bunch of models getting displayed, and, and that's what I meant by tracking and logging. Say, for example, if all these experiments are logged, it will actually help me to ensure that all the things are in place for any data scientist to come in and understand what has actually been tried and tested. What we can also do is we can actually select all the models, see which one to select. There will always be a trade-off between the accuracy and the biasness. And that's what we'll get to see if we compare all these models together and understand how they're looking at. So we get a visual representation. So every dot basically represents a model. On x-axis, you have the SVD metric and on y-axis is the balance accuracy. We hover over to any of the points and we get uh, the details about that model. Uh, and accordingly, we can decide how much biasness we want in the data set and how much accuracy are we looking. There'll, there'll always be a trade-off in this, but it actually gives us a platform in an automated way to understand which models to select and then deploy them in production. So eventually we go ahead, we deploy the model, we, we have this cataloging, so this is the model that we register, we go ahead, we select one of the models, we register the model, um, and eventually take this model, this is how it looks like when you deploy, register the model, and we deploy this in, in production. Now, once the model has been deployed into production, uh, there'll be the CI CD process in place, which will make sure that you know any changes that you make in the data set automatically uh, or in the code automatically gets rendered uh, and the entire pipeline of CI CD gets triggered uh, so that there's, there's, uh, the human intervention is as, as less as possible throughout the course of this entire deployment cycle. 
Now, once the model has been built, it has been deployed, the next step is all about explainability. How do we make sure that the models are explainable? That's where it, we have this framework of responsibility, especially the explainability part, wherein there are two levels to it. One is the exec level. Now, what we see over here is the exec level in, uh, description. The second one is a detailed data scientist level description. So there are two layers to it. One, an exec, if he wants to understand, just by spending a couple of minutes to understand how good the model is, is there any biasness in the data set? Why exactly a prediction was made as, as one or zero that uh, a patient will have a heart disease or not? Uh, all of those details can be displayed here. So what basically it tells us on the right hand side, the data set that you see, it's the data set which has been fed into production and the predictions have been made. The second column basically gives out the prediction whether heart disease is there or not, is expected to be there or not. And, and what you see on the left hand side is basically overall feature importance of the data set, which features are actually responsible for, um, you know, giving out a prediction zero or one. And what happens at the bottom, bottom left, what you see is basically an explanation of how that feature actually affects the probability. So it's not just the importance that we are telling, say the first feature that we have selected, it's actually the distribution that we get to see how exactly it is correlated. So all of this, what we saw on the left hand side, the bottom one and the top one is all about the global explanation. How do we explain on the whole? But if you want to select a specific record and understand that why a specific prediction was made as one, say, for example, I select the first one, I get to see at the bottom one, you can see local explanation, the probability is displayed as 0.55. Now, this tells me the reason why it was given one because 0.5 was a threshold is because of the features that are getting displayed at the top in a positive direction and the others in the negative direction. So this basically gives me an intuition and understanding of why a prediction was made. So this is this is for an exact level, just to spend a couple of minutes and understand if there's any biasness or explainability, um, you know, needs to be incorporated in the data set or the model. Uh, this is the place uh, which the, the exec can leverage. The second explanation part is the detailed data scientist level or detailed explanation. When if you look at the top five tabs, feature importance is exactly the same what we saw in the previous step. Uh, individual predictions is the other one, wherein when we get into the details, this will really help. All these plots are really helpful for the data scientists to actually troubleshoot and understand why the models are making certain predictions. Because if, if the model is not performing as well as they want to be, they can uh, they can actually troubleshoot it using these uh, statistical analysis. There's another what if analysis available. Say for example, what happens if I change a certain value in the data set for a specific patient? How how does my probability look? Like. So that what if analysis plays an important role again in understanding the entire data set and, the, and then the use case that you're working with. So these are the two different levels of explainability that we breathe into this entire process. Uh, the last but the most important one in this entire process is how do we monitor the models? Given that we have built the model, we have developed the model, we have mitigated the bias that we detected up front, um, we've ex explained the predictions. Now the most important part is it is into production. We need to maintain and monitor the model. And that's where we have this automated report which basically gives us which features have actually drifted. And I actually will speak about what exactly this data drift is all about, but it, it basically tells that which features have actually drifted and why they have drifted because you see the change in the distribution. Um, um, and because there's a change in the distribution, the model that has learned on the data set that is no longer available. And that's why the model is, is not performing that well. And I'll get into the depth of why, what exactly is data drift um, and what do we mean by all of that? So this, this report, if you look at, uh, we get an understanding of where the distribution change has happened in the data set. But eventually, if that feedback needs to be incorporated in the data set. That is the most important part when we speak about the model maintenance part of it, because if that connection towards the end is not there, it becomes really difficult to make sure that seamless process is taking place because model might be deployed into production and it might be of no use because the prediction that it is making is actually not making sense to the business. So those critical decisions will, will get hampered. And that's where the feedback or model maintenance is really very important.